Welcome to the reading of this book from E.W. Kenyon, The Wonderful Name of Jesus. This message is a struggle to make real to the modern church the hidden wealth of an almost unknown truth of the Word of God. The writer has felt for years that the disciples had a power to which we are utterly strangers and that this power should belong to the church. He has been seeking a solution to this problem and believes that this book will be an unveiling of the hidden spring. We trust that others will build upon this foundation and that before the return of our Lord, a portion at least of the body of believers will be living in the freshness of the power of the early church. If the book helps you, pass it on. Chapter 1. The Why of the Book Several years ago, I was holding meetings in a city in Tennessee. One afternoon, while giving an address on the name of Jesus, a lawyer interrupted me, asking, Do you mean to say that Jesus gave us the power of attorney, the legal right to use his name? I said to him, Brother, you are a lawyer, and I am a layman. Tell me, did Jesus give us the power of attorney? He said, If language means anything, then Jesus gave to the church the power of attorney. Then I asked him, What is the value of this power of attorney? He answered, It depends upon how much there is back of it, how much authority, how much power this name represents. Then I began the search to find how much power and authority Jesus had. Then this book came. The measure of his ability is the measure of the value of that name, and all that is invested in that name belongs to us. For Jesus gave us the unqualified use of his name. John 16, 24, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be made full. Jesus here not only gives us the use of his name, but he also declares that the prayer prayed in his name will receive his special attention. Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Jesus says, You ask of the Father in my name, I will endorse that, and the Father will give it to you. This puts prayer on a purely legal basis, for he has given us the legal right to use his name. As we take our privileges and rights in the new covenant and pray in Jesus' name, it passes out of our hands into the hands of Jesus. He then assumes the responsibility of that prayer, and we know that he said, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me, and I know that thou hearest me always. In other words, we know that the Father always hears Jesus, and when we pray in Jesus' name, it is as though Jesus himself were doing the praying. He takes our place. Prayer, a business proposition. This places prayer not only on legal grounds, but makes it a business proposition. When we pray, we take Jesus' place here to carry out his will, and he takes our place before the Father. He said that it should not only cover our prayer life, but it also can be used in our combat against the unseen forces that surround us. And these signs shall accompany them that believe, or literally, the believing ones. Every child of God is a believing one. In my name they shall cast out demons, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Here he is revealing his part in the Great Commission. In that great document he says, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. I am sending you out to make disciples of all nations. Lo, I am with you always. He is with us in the power and authority of his name. What does the name mean to the Father, to the church, and to Satan? To the Father, it must mean more than our hearts or minds will ever grasp. But we can suggest a little of the wealth that the Father has stored in that name. First, he inherited a more excellent name than any of the angels as the first begotten Son. Second, God gave to him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in the three worlds. Third, by his conquest over sin, Satan, disease, death, hell, and the grave, he acquired a name that is above all names. When Jesus gave us the legal right to use his name, the Father knew all that that name would imply when breathed in prayer by oppressed souls, and it is his joy to recognize that name. So the possibilities enfolded in that name are beyond our understanding. And when he says to the church, Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, He is giving us a signed check on the resources of heaven and asking us to fill it in. It would pay the church to begin an exhaustive study of the resources of Jesus in order to get a measurement of the wealth that name holds for her today. Chapter 2. How He Obtained His Name Before we go further in the study of the name of Jesus, it would be well for us to know something of the man. 
see his standing in heaven, his achievements in the plan of redemption, and the glory and honor that belongs to him today as he sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. Let us turn to Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. God having of old times spoken unto the fathers in the prophets, by divers portions and in divers manners, a message here and a message there, hath at the end of these days spoken unto us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the effulgence of his glory and the very image of his substance, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made purification of sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, having become by so much better than the angels, as he hath inherited a more excellent name than they. God spoke through men of old by special illumination of their minds, but in these last days he speaks unto us in the person of his Son. It is more than through him, it is more than by him, it is God manifest in the flesh, carrying out his will, speaking his own inner thoughts in the life and acts of the Son. Not only did he speak through Jesus, but more especially was God manifest in the Son. It was God in Christ, and from this new throne, the body of his Son, he is speaking to man in a new revelation of himself. To this Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and who being the outshining of his very glory and the very image of his substance, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made a substitution for sins, when he had satisfied every claim of justice and met every need of man, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, the highest seat in the universe. When God speaks through man, he must absolutely take possession of the man, so that man will not use his reasoning faculties. But in the case of Jesus, it was not possession, it was the eternal Son himself. He could say, Father, give me the glory I had with thee before the worlds were. He remembered his place in the Father's bosom. He would say, I came out from the Father. I came into the world. Again I leave the world and go unto the Father. Have I been so long time with you, and dost thou not know me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He was the revelation of the Father. He did not have to imitate God. He was God. His threefold greatness. Some men are born to a great name, as a czar or a king. Others make their name great by achievements, or have a great name conferred upon them. Jesus is great because he inherited a great name. His name is great because of achievements. He is great because a great name was conferred upon him. He inherited a greater name than any angelic being, and as a son, he is heir of all things, and through him the ages have been brought into being. He is the effulgence, the very outshining of the Father. His name comes to him as an inheritance, and what it must have been to have inherited this name from his great Father God. In Philippians 2, 9 and 10, we find, Wherefore also God highly exalted him, and gave unto him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of the beings in heaven and the beings on earth and the beings under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If it tells us in Hebrews that he inherited a greater name than the angels, here it declares that God gave unto him the name which is above every name. The inference is that there was a name known in heaven, unknown elsewhere, and this name was kept to be conferred upon someone who would merit it. And Jesus, as we know him, the eternal Son, as he is known in the bosom of the Father, was given the name. And at this name, every knee shall bow in the three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell. And every tongue shall confess that he is Lord of the three worlds, to the glory of God the Father. This is the man. It is this being who has given us the right to use his name. In Ephesians 1.17, we find a prayer by Paul, a most unusual prayer. He prays that the Father will open the eyes of our understanding, that we may know something of the riches of the Father's inheritance in us, and then that our eyes may be opened, that we may see what is the exceeding greatness of His power on our behalf who believe. He declares it is according to the working of the strength of God's might, which was wrought in the dead body of Jesus when He raised Him from among the dead, and when He raised Him and made Him to sit at His right hand in the heavenlies, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And he gave him to be head over all things for the benefit of his church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all things in all. 
he not only inherited a more excellent name than any other being in the universe, God not only gave him a name before which every being in the three worlds shall bow and confess his lordship, but here God has given to him a name which is above every name, and he has seated him in the highest place in the universe and has made him head over all things. For what purpose? God has made this investment for the benefit of the church. He has made this deposit on which the church has a right to draw for her every need. He has given to him the name that has within it the fullness of the Godhead, the wealth of the eternities, and love of the heart of the Father God, and that name is given us. We have the right to use that name against our enemies. We have the right to use it in our petitions. We have the right to use it in our praises and worship. That name has been given unto us. But this is only the beginning of the wonders and the value of the greatness of that name. In Colossians 2.15, we get a deeper view of his conquest of the satanic forces just before he rose from the dead. Having despoiled the principalities and the powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The picture here is of Christ in the dark regions of the lost, in awful combats with the host of darkness. It gives us a glimpse of the tremendous battle and victory that Jesus won before he rose from the dead. The margin reads, Having put off from himself the principalities and powers, it is evident that the whole demon host, when they saw Jesus in their power, simply intended to swamp him, overwhelm him, and they held him in fearful bondage until the cry came forth from the throne of God that Jesus had met the demands of justice, that the sin problem was settled and man's redemption was a fact. The mighty victor. When this cry reached the dark regions, Jesus rose and hurled back the host of darkness and met Satan in awful combat, as described in Hebrews 2.14, in order that through death he might paralyze him that held the dominion of death, that is, the devil. In other words, after Jesus had put off from himself the demon forces and the awful burden of guilt, sin, and sickness that he carried with him down there, he grappled with Satan, conquered him, and left him paralyzed, whipped, and defeated. The words that Jesus spoke are fulfilled in Luke 11, 21 and 22. When a strong man, fully armed, guardeth his own court, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger man than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him his whole armor, wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoil. So when Christ rose from the dead, he not only had the keys of death and of hell, but he had the very armor in which Satan trusted. He has defeated the devil, he has defeated all hell, and he stands before the three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell, as the undisputed victor over a man's ancient destroyer. He conquered Satan before his own cohorts, his own servants in the dark regions of the damned, and there he stood in the dread place, the absolute victor and master. Is it any wonder that fresh from such tremendous victories he should say to the disciples, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. He stands as the master and the ruler of the universe. His name now is above every name, and at his name we can understand how every knee shall bow, and all this authority and power that Jesus gained by his mighty conquest is in that name, and he has given that name to us. The authority that he has won is delegated to us in the use of his name. All he was is in that name. All he is today is in that name, and that name is ours. Jesus was given that name that he might give it to us, he gave his name to us that we might carry out the will of the Father in this dispensation in which we are living. We know the early church utilized this authority. The early church acted for Jesus in his stead. They wrought miracles, and the miracles opened doors for ministry and service. Authority. It gave authority to their credentials, a standing in the communities where they preached. They had the coin of the unseen kingdom. The omnipotence of God was invested in that name in the early church, and the disciples used it with a fearless abandonment that is absolutely thrilling. They believed in God. They lived and walked in the realm of the supernatural. It was the days of God on earth to the people where they ministered. The use of the name. It might be well for us now to look at the promises Jesus made in regard to the use of his name. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 13. This is a striking promise when we realize that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, that Jesus holds the highest position in the universe as the head of the church. Here is the charter promise. Hitherto ye have asked nothing in my name. 
Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be made full. John 16, 24. Jesus says, Hitherto, or up to this time, you have never prayed in my name. But now, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. This promise is the most staggering statement that perhaps ever fell from the lips of the man of Galilee, that we are to have the use of his name, that name of omnipotence. He does not say, if we believe or if we have faith, this name has been given to us. It is ours. What is mine? I do not need faith to use. When we are born into the family of God, the right to use the name and the privilege to use it comes with the new birth. All the authority vested in that name is given to us to bring glory to the name of the Father, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This Son, who is an outcast on the earth and crucified, hung naked before the world. His name shall go ringing down through the ages. Wherever the shame of the crucifixion has gone, the glory and might and power and honor of that name will go. Wherever men have ridiculed Jesus, that name will go. Wherever men have cursed that man, that name will go with its omnipotence, its might and power, shedding blessings and healing and comfort upon the human race and honor and glory to God the Father. He now is to be with us in the power of that name. That name is to take his place. All that he could do locally then can be done locally now by every believer. In other words, he multiplies himself as rapidly as he multiplies the church. For the weakest son has the legal right now to all the grace and might and power and blessing and health and healing and life enwrapped in the person who bore that name. All that Jesus was, his name is. All that Jesus was, that name will ever be during this dispensation. That name has lost none of the power of the man who bore it. In these scriptures, we have seen that the Father has lifted him to the highest position in the universe. He has conferred upon him the highest name in the universe. He has bestowed upon him honor and glory and power and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenlies, far above every known authority. And now all this honor, this glory, this authority, this power is vested in the name of Jesus, and this name is given to us. New Land Ahead Oh, that our eyes were open, that our souls would dare rise into the realm of omnipotence where the name would mean to us all that the Father has invested in it, that we would act up to our high privileges in Christ Jesus. This is practically an unexplored tableland in Christian experience. Here and there some have experienced the authority vested in the name of Jesus. We have seen the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see, those on the verge of death brought back instantly to health and vigor. But so far, none of us has been able to take permanent place in our privileges and abide where we may enjoy the fullness of this mighty power. But we have a conviction that before the Lord Jesus returns, there will be a mighty army of believers who will learn the secret of living in the name of reigning in life living the victorious, transcendent, resurrection life of the Son of God among men. If our minds could only grasp the fact that Satan is paralyzed, stripped of his armor by the Lord Jesus, and that disease and sickness are servants of this man, that at his voice they must depart, it would be easy to live in this resurrection realm. You remember in Matthew 8, when the centurion talked with Jesus, he said, But speak the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man set under authority, and I say to this one, Go, and he goeth, to another, Come, and he cometh. You have been set over diseases, as I am set over these hundred men, and am called a centurion, so you are master over disease and sickness, over demons and the laws of nature. All you have to do is speak, and your servants obey, as I speak, and my servants obey. In this beautiful illustration, we see that the centurion had risen to a higher plane of spiritual appreciation of Jesus than most believers enjoy today. Chapter 3 what is back of the name? There has never been a more intense battle over the deity of the man of Galilee than is being waged today. The great body of the church do not see, as they never have seen, the issue squarely. Neither have they realized the result of this struggle. Unfortunately, we have arrayed against the deity of Christ, a body of semi-intellectuals. There are scarcely a half dozen who belong to the first rank, either of scholastic or intellectual strength, that have been engaged on either side. The debates that have been staged in different parts of the country have savored more of the barnstorming tactics of the modern political demagogue than of cold-blooded intellectual investigation into the merits of the issue. The deity of the man of Galilee is the crux of Christianity. If this can be successfully challenged, then Christianity has lost its heart and it will cease to function. It will become a dead religion. There is no denial that the challenge of his deity has already begun, its reactionary effect upon society. If Jesus is not deity, he is not Lord. 
If he is not Lord, then he cannot interfere with our moral activities. If he is not Lord, then the laws that have been founded upon his teachings have lost their force. The morals that surround marriage with its lofty ideals have no basis of fact. If Jesus of Nazareth is not a revelation from God with divine authority, then he is but a man. If he is but a man, all that we have built around him must be destroyed, and we have built around this man our modern civilization. He has been the inspiration of young men. They have kept themselves clean and pure as they've looked upon his wonder life and sought to win his smile. Young women in the secret of their chamber have looked upon the face of the man of Galilee and have pledged to preserve the purity of their womanhood that they might be worthy of the love and confidence of the man who died 2,000 years ago for humanity. Children have been incited to obedience and purity by the example and teachings of that man. Businessmen have been deterred from crooked dealings by the consciousness that one day they would meet that man and give an account of the deeds done in their office. Men of all walks of life have felt a strange kinship with this man who walked the shores of Galilee, solitary among a multitude. To say he was but a good man is an insult. To say that he was the highest expression of deity in humanity is to throw the lie into his face. Jesus is, or he is not, what he said he was. We have no record of his sayings nor of his doings outside the four Gospels. If we repudiate them, then we have but a mythical picture of the man. If we challenge one of them, we have a right to challenge all of them. Either he stands or falls on those four biographical sketches. If he is not the Son of God, who is he? I want to believe that he is an incarnation. I want to believe that he dealt with the sin problem. I want to believe that he died for my sins and that he rose again for my justification. I want to believe that he is seated at God's right hand, today as the intercessor and mediator of the human race. I want to believe that what he said about heaven is true. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Skepticism holds no guarantee for my future. Civilization has not only been builded around this man, but he has been builded into civilization. If you destroy his character, his standing, his place, then civilization must disintegrate. The wave of crime and lawlessness that is sweeping over this land is but a byproduct of the modernist challenge of his integrity.